Uh, welcome back to my channel, everyone. I am greatly pleased to have four-time Grammy Award winner Lenny White here today. Drumming pioneer, jazz rock pioneer. Oh, I love you. You get pictures of Miles and Coltrane behind you. How cool is that? Um, well, I could have pictures of other people. No, those are perfect. Those are the people to have <laughs> behind your head. Uh, Lenny played on the groundbreaking Bitches Brew and Red Clay, as well as recordings by Andrew Hill, Joe Henderson, Curtis Fuller, <laughs> Eddie Henderson, Jaco Pistorius, Don Cherry, Bobby Hutcherson, Kenny Garrett, Al DiMiola, Wallace Roney, Buster Williams, and we are here to talk about this record that Lenny played on in 1970, Blackstone Leg of the Sea, that has just been reissued. This record includes double LP set with Woody Shaw, Gary Bartz, Benny Maupin, George Cable, Ron Carter, Clint Houston, and Lenny White. Um, how you doing, Lenny? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Good, good. Thank you so much for being here. Um, oh, I didn't mention you also have 17 albums as a leader. Five as part of Return to Forever. Can you confirm a story I heard from me once? I think, well, if it's a story, I think uh, Stan Clark told me that when you guys were mixing Return to For uh, Romantic Warrior, that um, Chick wanted to mix it or master it or something. And the band said, no, Lenny has to do it. And that's part of the reason that sound, record sounds so incredible. Well, what happened was uh, we had done the record and uh, we gave it to Chick. And Chick went and mixed it and came back with it. And none of us liked it. What did it sound like? Uh, I don't remember, actually. But um, I do remember that it had to be redone. And so um, everybody said that I should do it. And I went to um, London and with the engineer who um, had done the record and we mixed it. And what you hear is what we did. We went to Trident Studios in London and Dennis McKay and I uh, mixed it. And what came out as Romantic Warrior is the mix that we did. What accounts for that highly lush, almost oversaturated, beautiful textures on that record? What did you guys do? Well, I mean, you know, the fact is, Usually what happens when you make a recording, if you get the sound that you want, um, you should be able to retain that in the mix. It's not there if you don't put it there. But once you put it there, then it's up to you to know how to get the sounds that you put on tape to translate to people who listen to the record. Where did you all re record that record, Romantic Warrior? Uh, we recorded it in uh, Colorado um, oh. at Jim Gersh Show's studio. That um, There were a bunch of records that were made there, but the studio burned down. Um, it was a great, great, great studio. Where was Hymn of the Seventh Galaxy recorded? Hymn of the Seventh Galaxy was recorded in New York City. Um, I believe it was, I don't know if it was the record plant. It might have been the record plant um, in New York City. That's my, uh, still my favorite uh, Return to Forever record. And I love uh, Polydor, somebody put up that, all those alternate takes at one point. And it had the band, how it sounded with Steve Gadd. And yeah. as great as Steve Gadd was, it's a whole different animal with you in there. It's just like somebody lit a fire under the band. And you bring that same fire to this record. This is one of your greatest recordings as far as drumming goes. Man, you are just, I wish the drums were better recorded. But man, it's just, it's a tutorial in uh, in jazz drumming, really. And you were, you were just so 
on fire and prodding and pushing and pulverizing. Did, did you realize when you made this record while you all were recording it that something special was happening or was it just another session? You know what? I mean, any session at that point, especially in my career, was great because I hadn't done it before. That record, I think, was um, the third the third or fourth record that I had done. Um, so any recording at that point was special for me because this is what I really wanted to do. I wanted to be able to represent the music and have a voice in the music as someone young coming up and trying to emulate and represent like all my heroes did. Um, I take it was Bitches Brew one of those records before this? Bitches Brew was the first. And what was second? Well, there's a record that I did. Actually, I think Passing Ships it's like just was put out before um, Red Clay. Wow. Um, and then Woody was, uh, I think, the third, fourth. Third or fourth record I did. And, you know, this record, it's just nonstop burning and great compositions and great soloing. You get some open solos that are really wonderful. What did, Does this at all represent the sound of jazz, early 70s New York City? Yes, I, I would think so. Um, I had played with Woody and Jackie McLean and Jackie McLean's band. And, um, you know, there was a, a real advanced and fiery um, movement with the music definitely in New York City. And, you know, Woody got an opportunity to make a record and he asked me to be a part of it. And, you know, some of my friends that I had played with on it. I mean, Clint Houston and George Cables, uh, we were in a band together called the Jazz Samaritans. And that was great to be able to play with them. And Gary Bartz, Benny Maupin, you know, I knew these guys. I was younger, but like I knew them and I had an opportunity to play with them in different kinds of situations. So this was a great opportunity to record with them and then the great Ron Carter. I mean, Ron, Ron, I made Red Clay with Ron. I made Passing Ships with Ron. And I made this with Ron in my early career. So I had gotten an opportunity to, under Ron's tutelage, to learn really how to play this music. And, you know, it was special. So Ron and I have been friends and he's been a mentor to me for since the seventies. Well, you are certainly playing on this record. And what do you recall from this session? Do you have memories of it? Is it too too much of a whirlwind for you to remember it? No, I I, I do remember. I mean, like you know, uh, one of those tunes was pretty fast, pretty swift. I think Ooh, Ron Carter. Grind. Who yeah. ends grand? Man, I was going to ask you, are you playing every eighth note? It is. Whoa. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is jazz is not played like with eighth notes. Jazz is triplets. So when you play a jazz ride, it's triplets. It's not eighth notes. But are so, you playing ding, 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 or ding, da, da, ding, da, da, ding, da, da, ding, da, da, ding? Yes. Yeah. Man, that's really, really fast. Huh. Yeah, I mean, Max Roach played fast like that. Tony Williams played fast like that. You know, all of the Magnificent Seven played fast like that. So, you know, that was out in that music. And um, so what, what do you recall of the session? Did you all rehearse? Do you remember what Woody had to say? Was there any direction? Were you just yeah, reading we had some, 
but he had some direction about what it is that he wanted. You know, um, he had written a bunch of music that was, you know, pretty good. And uh, what I do remember George Cables having a tune that I had played with the Jazz Samaritans put on this record, which is Think On Me. And then later on, I recorded something that sounded very, very similar that Freddie Hubbard wrote called Skydive. And if you listen to the two pieces of music, you say, oh, I see that there's some similarity hmm. between the two, you know. So it was a really good, good session. I mean, um, it was fiery. Woody was fiery. Woody was on fire at that point, too. And, you know, it was a great camaraderie that happened on that session. Again, because I had played with people that I knew and opportunity to play like we play, you know, in a club or play like we play when we have a jam session on a recording. And it was open. It was great to be able to play with, with not with someone saying, okay, guys, can you tone it down a little bit and play? You know, there wasn't that at all. No. And it's unusual that it's on contemporary. There's no other record on contemporary that sounds like this. I think of contemporary as, you know, a West Coast cool bop label or whatever. This is totally different. Well, it was. It was. But, but I... The head of that label, you might have it on on the record. What, what was his name? Koenig. Oh, Lester Koenig. Yes, Lester right. Koenig. He produced it as well. Yes, I, I believe he had owned the label at the time, and you know, as I said, there was uh, a real good movement that was much more open and fiery with the music in the early 70s like that. And, you know, I believe he understood to do the record. You guys play what you want to play and how you want to play it. You know, I'm reading uh, this great book on John Coltrane by Ben Ratliff. And near the end, he talks about the the different movements across the country that Coltrane's music sort of sprouted like the Horace Tapscott thing and, and B.A.G. and uh, A.A.C.M. Were you guys aware of what all those, those guys were doing as well in these different cities? More of a free movement, more explosive? Of course. Of course. I mean, you know, like um, in the 60s, uh, the, a lot of part of the 60s, a little bit younger, but there was the avant-garde movement that was really prevalent here in New York. And so this was like fringe. There were things that started to morph and, you know, Bitches Brew had been done. So there were backbeats being played in different kind of configurations. Um, electric instruments were used, the roads was used. So like, yes, there was um, a, a, a universal consciousness and the music was listened to all parts of the country, all parts of the world. And so, to stay abreast of what was going on, you had to know what was happening in Chicago, what was happening in LA, what was ha happening, all different places in the States is a manifestation of everybody being aware of what everybody was doing. Such an intense period. And a lot of that music is slowly starting to come out. Uh, that was generated in that period. I just picked up this uh, Milford Graves twofer of him and Arthur Doyle recording it down in Soho at the Lofts. You must have played in all those loft rehearsal things too. What was yes, that like? I, it was great. I mean, there was one building in particular 
on 19th Street that Chick Corea, Dave Holland, and Dave Liebman all lived in. It was a loft building. Wow. And they all three of them lived in that building. And we would get together and go to Dave Liebman's loft and play. Michael and Randy Brecker, Paul Schroeder, Steve Grove, play, have sessions and play. And wow. that kind of manifested into the music that came out because Steve Grossman and Lieb wound us this real great uh, quest to try to be free and expressive and kick ass. So the band was that's Quest, what we right? Did. Wasn't it called Quest? Well, uh, Chick had a band. I think I'm not. I'm not sure. No, it wasn't a band. We didn't have a band per se. Right. We just got together all the time, and you know, have sessions and play. And then what happened is everybody that would come there and play in different configurations wound up on all the music that was being recorded around that time period. When they lived so on it was kind of cool. Was that 19th and 6th Avenue? Or a different avenue? No, it was between um, hmm, between seven, yeah, 6th and 7th. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 6th and 7th. Yeah, yeah. there were all those, a lot of big buildings up there with large floors. Um, on Him of the 7th Galaxy, what was so great about it is that music was extremely electric and extremely uh, multi-dimensional, and there was no synthesizer used. It's all just roads, which was really interesting. Yes, yes, yeah. That record, man. That record's incredible. Um, that's one of the great fusion records of all time. So, so what did what do you remember? And what sort it, of things? And it, and it also, it also was pre Stanley Clark. Alembic bass. I guess that's true. What was he playing then? At EB3. What kind of drums yeah. were you playing then? Gretsch. And do we hear your Gretsch drums on this record? You hear something similar to that, but not, it was more of a hybrid. I, I believe that I used my um, oral drum bass drum. What I used on Bitches Brew. What what bass drum? Oh, I have right, the oil I, can. Oh, that's on this as well. Uh, explain yeah. that if people don't know. Well, it was a bass drum that was made from an oil drum, in, and it was about sixteen inches. And a friend of uh, Steve Grossman's actually took it, hollowed it out, put some uh, rims on the both sides of it so that it could be a drum and made it an actual drum. And Elvin Jones wanted to buy it, but I bought it before he got it. <laughs> <laughs> is that on uh, Him of the Seventh Galaxy? No. It is? Him of the Seventh... No, no. Him of the Seventh Galaxy is my greatest drums. Right. So this this has the yeah. oil cam bass drum. And what's the snare drum? Or I had a great snare drum. And a Zildjian cymbals, probably K's back then, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I just wish the uh I wish the drums were a little uh I mean you can hear them just fine, but you know, they're I wish they were a little more full and and, and cl even cleaner. So what sort of things did Woody uh say, if you recall? Well, well you know, Woody was Woody was, you know, you know. The music kind of directed itself. The fact is, is that when the composer writes something that's pretty open and pretty, um, in, in, in terms of how you would approach it, energetic, I mean, I, sometimes the music plays itself. I just recently did a live recording with Steve Teray 
And, you know, I said, Steve, what do you want on this? He said, well, like, you know, the music plays itself. The song will play itself. And that was the case, you know. Guys at your level. So, so sometimes in the, yeah, and some, sometimes as a composer, you don't want to write a whole bunch of stuff. You pick the musician that you want to play the music and they play the music. The song plays itself. Like, so what? What are you going to tell John Coltrane and Bill Evans and, you know, um, what are you going to tell them to play? You write something, they bring what it is that they bring to your music and the rest is history. That's for sure. Um, where was uh, A&R Studios? Was it in Midtown or something? Usually, I mean, back in those days, around the 40s, is 40th streets, 40s, 30s, 40s. That's where the studios were in Manhattan. Oh. And, you know, um, you got an opportunity to go to the studio and be in Midtown, you know. Things have changed since then, but uh, yeah, yeah they were around the. There were so yeah. many records done at ANR. That was such a major studio. That's on the back of so many records. Um, yeah, was it just one studio? Were there multiple studios there? ANR was one studio, but a lot of the record companies had their own studios. There was Atlantic had a studio, Columbia had a couple Three, of studios. Three. Yeah. So, um, so um, there were a lot. And then Rudy did most of the records that he did in the 50s and 60s. Well, the, early, earlier um, in Hackensack. Did you go to Hackensack? You were too young to, to record in Hackensack, weren't you? I, I mean, think... Red Clay was done. No, Rudy. Red Clay was done. And in. Uh, Inglewood Cliffs. Right. That, you didn't, you didn't I didn't do Hackensack. anything in Hackensack. No, I didn't do anything in Hackensack. So you're too young for that. What was the first, was Red Clay the first thing you did at, at Rudy at Van Gelder's? Yes, yes. Oh. I walked into Rudy Van Gelder's and thought that that was Hallowood Ground because they you had done. done. Wow. It, yeah, because they had done a Love Supreme and Imperial Isles. And uh, uh, um, speak no evil. All of those records were done there. I right. mean, please, that was Hollywood Brown. Yeah, it still it still is. is. Maybe more so than ever. Um. So uh, I, I keep interrupting you before you can answer. So Woody didn't have a lot of direct. Uh, this song is like this, and we're going to do that. He just gave you the music. No, 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 no. Don't don't be misinformed. If I've misinformed you, please. All the composers that write this music and come into the studio have an intention and they know what it is that they want. But just as a film director directs a film, they call certain actors, our musicians, to get the ideas that they have in head out so that they translate something that you write that was in the style of, you might call those people that made the record that you are trying to sound like or have a feeling like. And then they do what they do, and you get what you want. Were um, were you guys reading charts, or had you already rehearsed it? I didn't read charts. They did. Yes. Hmm. Um, you know, there's that there's something about reading charts. There's something about the ideas that the composer has is put on paper, and the orchestra plays the notes that the composer thought of to get the idea or the vibe that it is that they want. And the conductor 
kind of takes what the composer wrote and makes it accessible and translatable to the musicians. When a composer writes, I mean, if you think about it, so what? It's a very, very simple tune, but it's one of the all-time classic tunes because of what the musicianship that was applied to playing two notes translated to all of us to say, wow, that's amazing. You didn't listen to it from the compositional standpoint, but afterwards you said, wow, that's very, very simple what he wrote and look what they did with it. So when you think about that and you say, well, were we reading charts? Yes, most of them did read charts, but it didn't sound like we're reading charts. What you, what you got from the music is the emotional input. From, I mean, a note is a note, but how you play that note, where you phrase the note, makes all the world of difference. When it's people like yourself. Um, where was, you had played with Woody in uh, Jackie McLean's band. At this point in time, where was uh, Woody Shaw's head at, as we used to say? Where was he at as a person, as a musician? Well, I, I can't speak for Woody. I mean, I know that I had countless conversations with him playing with Jackie Mack. And then I played with him again in Joe Henderson's band. So, I mean, you know, like my early part of my career, I spent a lot of time playing with Woody Shaw. I mean, Woody was from Newark. I was from Queens, you know, um, and I grew up listening to, playing with guys like Woody, Stanley Clark, George Cables, you know, Billy Hart. Um, you know, these were guys that I met early on in my musical career, and they've become lifelong friends. Yeah, they're your friends. Is um is Billy still out in Teaneck or something? No, he lives in Montclair. Montclair, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Without going through this tune by tune, you mentioned Think of Me, which is very I mean, you're driving, prodding, shape shifting. You're like, like a magician in that track. It's like the drums are just doing cartwheels. You're so on fire. Um it's really remarkable. That track and also the up. Lost and Found opens with a drum solo where you're just blazing. Would you say that was one of the early peaks of your drumming? You know, I I don't like my drumming back then. Why, but why not? Because I was reaching for things that I hadn't been able to realize. I don't know. It sounds to me like you're executing everything you're going for on this record. I don't hear any hesitancy here. And I'm glad that you felt that way. <laughs> Don't change at all. <laughs> so you're saying you would listen to it and you would point things out you don't like? Listen, my okay, if you think about it, the first recording was Bitches Brew. Now, with that, there was a collective consciousness of we were all shape-shifting because we did not know what Miles wanted. Miles picked the musicians that he picked because he felt as though they could get across what he had in his head. Excuse me. So from that experience, that's what I've shaped my musical life on. That experience that I had when I made that record. <clears throat> And so with Wayne Shorter, Miles Davis, Chick Corea, Josiah Newell, you, you know, these 
music, Jack, Dijonette, <clears throat> these musicians at that point in their career were morphing and changing how music sounds. So since then, whatever kind of music that I play, I try to do that. Well, of this record, and Lost and Found is the one where you're burning. Parts of this record sound like somebody, I mean, Jack Dijonette, he's he's a master. But some of it sounds like somebody put Jack in a cannon and blew him out. Because you're <laughs> just, you're just, it's insane the stuff you're playing. Um, and you keep doing it. That track, but well, the whole record, but Lost and Found, I wrote here, it's uh, very fast, super up-tempo. And I wondered if you're playing every eighth note. But yeah, you, you're playing swing triplets, I guess. <laughs> But um, yeah. it's but are you sometimes I know drummers would just allude to a tempo that fast, but are you literally playing it? Well, let me tell you something. I learned early on. I mean, I heard Tony Williams say something. You know, I, I listened to uh, Four and More. And what I got out of listening to Four and More is I heard from the recording of that, I heard every beat on Tony's ride symbol to the point where what I would do, how I would practice is I'd go into the corner of a room and I'd sit in the corner of a room with just the ride symbol and nothing else because I could hear everything. I could hear close up and I'd play the ride symbol and I'd play every beat. The fact is, and I also in watching a master class that Tony gave. He said that when you you live on planet Earth and we're bound by gravity. It, you, you mentioned Bitches Brew, which is very atmospheric and even red clay. This this out al this album is much more from a drumming standpoint, all very intense. Every tune's intense. Even something that starts out new world is kind of atmospheric, then it's like really super funky. Uh, Boo Ann's Grand, I wrote down here, is like hot, hard bop fire. Um, yes. And a deed for Dolphy is a tribute to er Eric Dolphy. What was, uh, did you all want to go out and play this music live? I didn't get an opportunity to do it. I think I played, there was a band that we did the uh, uh, Left Bank uh, Jazz Festival, jazz thing. And it was Woody. I think Tyron Washington played. Oh wow! And, and um, Gary Bartz played. Uh, I think Reggie Workman played bass, and um, Stanley Cowell played. And we played some of that music. Mm. Which record do you record after this record? Do you remember? I think I did a record called Raw Root with. Harold Alexander. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. Huh. Um. And Harold Alexander, that might be on mainstream. Um. You know, there are so many. You know, we're in the, as I say on my channel, we're in the golden age of vinyl reissues. Anything that can be reissued is by all these majors, and people like Zell Feldman are finding these old tapes and cleaning them and releasing them. Are there any old recordings you're aware of that you're on that haven't been released, be they live or club dates or whatever? I think the records that I did after this was uh, Crankin' with um, Curtis Fuller. And I did a record with Buddy Terry that was on, um, I forgot, I don't want to say contemporary. It was a different label. Um Bob Shad had a label. Mainstream. And Some of those mainstream, mainstream records. Mainstream records. Um, and um, yeah, those are the records I think that I did after after that. So you're uh, a couple of years away from uh, Him of the Seventh Galaxy and Chick and all that. Yes. Well, Him of the Seventh Galaxy was, I think, 72. Oh, I so think. not that long at all. Wow. Not, not that long. Well, it was recorded um, in 70, it came out in 73. So they, uh, Gad was going to do it originally, um, then he couldn't, and, and Stanley brought you in. Well, yeah, I mean, what happened is, um, 
I was in a band called Azteca. Oh, right. That was on Columbia. And um, Clive Davis had just signed us, and we went to uh, London and played the Columbia Convention in London. And we were the band that uh, Clive debuted at midnight. And it was a band with uh, Coke and Pete Escovito. Wow. Um, Neil Sean played guitar. And uh, mm -hmm. Paul Jackson played bass. Tom Harrell played trumpet. What a band. It was a big band. Four horns. Wow. Four vocalists. Wow. Three percussion. Three keyboards. It was a big band, big band. And so I was, I had recorded with them and I was in San Francisco because the band was based in San Francisco. And Chick gave me a call from Japan. And he said, listen, Stanley and I are coming to Japan. I mean, coming to San Francisco to play the Keystone Corner. Would you play a week with us to kiss on the corner? And I said, yeah, of course. And um, so Stanley and Chick came to Keystone. Huh. And, we, and the three of us played as a trio. Wow. Chick played electric piano. Stanley played acoustic bass. And I played acoustic drums. <laughs> and uh, we played for a week. Of that week... Two guitar players sat in, Billy Connors and Barry Finnerty. So they went back to New York and asked Steve Gadd to play in the band. Oh. Because I stayed out in San Francisco. Ah, oh. right. And, um, so they went back and played. They made a recording. And then Steve decided that he didn't want to do it, that he wanted to stay in the studio. Right. Now, in the meantime, Chick calls me and says, hey, man, listen, why don't you come back and do this Return to Forever with us? <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll come back. Well, Lenny, thank you so much for speaking with me. This is really great. I could pick your brain forever. And I'm going to, uh, I mean, you know everybody. Get somebody to let you remaster Him of the Seventh Galaxy. People need to realize what an incredible record that is. That could be a Record Store Day record, man. That would sell like crazy. It could, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I love that record, even though it sounds like it's going through a meat grinder, but uh, <laughs> it's such an, it's so intense. I mean, it sort of matches the intensity of Intermounting Flame or something, but in some ways, I, I like it better, the the melodies and, God, I mean, Bill Connors is just so profound. It's just so, so great. Anyway, thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. I really appreciate it. Glad to be of your service. Thank you.